Am I on? Good. I said, Herb, uh, I'd like for you to watch for a van for me because my daughter's coming home from Germany with her husband, and when he comes home, we will want to have a van to travel in because I'm going to be driving forever. And he stood up from his chair, away from his desk, and he pointed at me. He said, the Lord sent you. He said, I have an 84 van sitting out there. And he said, I can give that to you for the best price you ever heard. And uh, then he started to explain to me a little bit about it. And I said, let me see it. Uh, I wasn't going to buy one then. That was in April. And uh, I wanted to wait till August to buy one, you know, and then I wouldn't have to be making payments on it all that time. And so uh, he walked me out, and he walked me out to this van that I have over there. And he said, uh, you can have that for $2,500, a 1984 van. Well, in the paper, those things were going from $5,000 up. And I said, Herb, I've got to ask you this. He said, I'm selling it for somebody else, for a company. I said, I've got to ask this. I said, could I have it for 23? He said, yes. <laughs> so I bought that van I've got over there for $2,300. And do you know, I praise God every day that I get in that thing, start it up, roll on down the road. It gets about 10 miles per gallon. It's got a big engine, but I pulled tons of our furniture all ready to California. And then we drove back, put a bed in the back, and wife and I stayed at Battle Mountain, Nevada, and on back, uh, and then stayed with our kids on the way. And of course, the Lord has provided us. But that van is just, uh, just a way that I just said, I need a van, and uh, the Lord has given us. And uh, we've driven all over. I've put uh, over 20,000 th 20, miles on that van since the 1st of August. And uh, it's, it's a good van. And I'm going to put another uh, ooh, 20, about 3,000 miles getting it back to California. And then I'm going to sell it. If anybody wants to buy it, they can have it. <laughs> I'll sell it for about... Uh, now, none of you will buy it, <laughs> because I'm going to sell it for what it's worth, Lord willing. Or I might even sell it to Dr. Winnegar out there, because he's been looking at it with some, some uh, greed. Now, I haven't told him. <laughs> I haven't told him what I paid for it. You carnal lady, you. <laughs> no, hey, I'll, I'll sell it to him for $4,000 or something like that. Anyway, I, wanted, I want to encourage you to do something this morning. I want you to go out of here today saying that I personally want to create a thirst in the life of the people that I meet. John chapter 4, you're all so familiar with it. John chapter 4 is the story of the woman at the well. And uh, uh, you're familiar with the w narrative, how that Jesus was on his way to Galilee from Judea, and he said, I must needs go through Samaria. And people speculate about why he said he must needs go through Samaria. I believe that this incident probably is the incident that I would say is the reason why he said that it was imperative that he go through Samaria. Samaria wasn't a good way to go. Samaria had uh, uh, had all kinds of thieves in the mountains and, uh, and uh, gangs, as a matter of fact, uh, Probably the fellows that were crucified with Jesus were some of those that had uh, found themselves hiding places in uh, the, the Samaritan countryside and hillsides. And uh, 
So it wasn't the, the right way to go. Usually they tell me that the Jews went over to the east side of the, the uh, river and went north and, and then came back across the, the Jordan River up closer to the Sea of Galilee where they would go back into Galilee, a more, uh, a more pleasant state and uh, with less uh, peril. Well, Jesus stopped at a well near Sychar. And uh, that was uh, a well where the people of Sychar would come to get water. And it was uh, in the middle of the day, and a woman came to get water. You remember the story. And uh, as uh, she was standing there, he asked her for water. And she said, how come you, being a Jew, ask us drink of me, which I'm a woman of Samaria? This is the ninth verse. And Jesus uh, and went on to say that uh, the, knowing that the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. And the woman uh, goes on to say, uh, You have nothing to draw with. And uh, then Jesus said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. The 14th verse, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. You know, my dear friends, they don't know where to get the water of water. And the only get it is from you. Back in 1932, a man by the name of Bob Houston had just graduated from pharmaceutical school in the University of Illinois or University of Nebraska Lincoln and uh, he had his fiance who was teaching school up near Sioux Falls South Dakota and they got married and with his pharmaceutical degree he went to a little top 300 in western South Dakota and there he set up a pharmacy and her folks and his folks came to see them and said, why in the world would you come out to this godforsaken country? If any of you have been in western uh, uh, South Dakota, you know what those parents were talking about. Why did you bring my daughter out here? And the daughter said, I'm his wife. I'm going to stay with him. And uh, so in the process of time, they saw that the depression was heavy upon them, and, and, uh, uh, but they got to caring for the people in the community. And so they finally decided that it was, it was a very difficult place to raise their family. They had a couple of children. And so their comment was that they would... Uh, their comment was that they would give it five years. We'll stay here five years. And so in about the fifth year, in the afternoon of a hot summer day, Bob was standing in his pharmacy swatting flies with a newspaper. And Dot said, I'll take the children and go home for a nap. I'm not obviously not needed there. The business wasn't that pressing. And she wasn't gone a half an hour till she came back. And he said, what's the matter? Too hot to sleep? She said, no. She said, I, I heard all of the noise on the highway out here. These tourists going by. And she said, what do you think they want? I don't know, Bob said. She 
said, they want cold water. Bob, you get that 16-year-old boy out of the high school over here. He draws real well. And you make up some signs. And she gave them something like uh, uh, a little poem like Burma Shave used to have. Any of you remember Burma? No, you kids, you don't know Burma Shave. Every, you do? Oh, that old man back there does. Every Sunday when we'd go to church, on the right-hand side, it was a, say, Paul acted so tickled, Ma thought he was pickled, he just tried Burma Shave, you know. That, that was the kind of poetry that they would have on the road. And you kids, you didn't remember that? We remember it, don't we? The old Burma Shave signs. And uh, see, now you, you're giving away your age there, Paul. But they made up a sign, something like, give your body a hug, get iced water at wall drug. And those signs went up on the road that afternoon. And before the evening, cars started to come. And they were giving free iced water. And you can go down here, straight south of here, on Highway 80, or 90, and you'll see a sign, free ice water at Waldrug. Have any of you ever seen it? You go on west, free ice water at Waldrug. Have any of you ever been to Waldrug? You've been there? It's about two city blocks. The first year they had to hire two people to finish out the summer. The next year they hired eight people, and Waldrug now is an enterprising Wall Street Enterprise. And it was because a woman said, what they need is water. What this whole world needs is water. They need water. You know, we need to create a thirst. Remember the song, Somewhere East of Suez, where the best is like the worst, and there ain't no Ten Commandments, and a man could raise a thirst. I don't remember even the name. I, I know that line. There ain't no Ten Commandments and a man could raise a thirst. You can imagine in an area where there are, in, in the lives of people in which there are no absolutes, that heart has to be thirsty. But they don't know what's there. They have to be thirsty. A lost world has to be thirsty to have something to set their feet on. There is a rock, which is a foundation, but there is also a rock, which was written in the desert, and water gushed forth. Isaiah 14, 16, and 17. While God was address addressing Lucifer, he said, And they shall look at thee narrowly, they should look narrowly upon thee and say, this is the man that made the world a desert place. That God-forsaken country in western South Dakota gave away free ice water right there near the Badlands at Wall, South Dakota. But there is a spiritual desert that was created by the wicked one. And you know the only place they can get water is from God's Word. And do you realize that you are the custodians of that water, that living water? Now, there are a lot of people that are like Dennis the Menace. I saw a 
comic strip. The first picture showed Dennis in his crib, rattling the crib and saying that he wanted a drink of water. And then we see his father up and in his bathrobe going down the stairs. In a little bit, he came up with a full glass of water. And as he walked into the room, little Dennis was standing there. And he had a full glass of water, and he handed the glass of water to Dennis. And then, in a moment, he took back the glass. And all that was used out of it was just ever so small. You couldn't even tell that he had drank a drop of it. And he, the last line of the comic strip said, I just wanted a sip. Do you know that there are a lot of people and Christians that say, all I want is a sip? When really, we personally should drink deeply of the water of life. I remember on a hot June day when I'd get off the cultivator and unhook Queen and Star, take them over to the horse tank, and they'd stick their heads down in the water clear up to their eyes. They wanted to drink deeply. We were at Bible camp down in uh, Camp Cherith, and uh, Tim and Joy were counselors, and they were both in the cabins, and Aaron was in the trailer with wife and I, and we didn't have any facilities there, and it was a good city block from our trailer up to the kitchen. By one o'clock in the morning, here's Aaron saying, Grandpa, I'm thirsty. So I put on my robe and my slippers and walked through that dew-filled grass all the way up to the kitchen, got a big glass, and as I left the kitchen with that glass of water, it was a large glass, I thought, is this going to be another Dennis the Menace scenario? <laughs> and when I got there, I handed the water to little three-year-old Aaron, and he took that and drank the whole glass. And he handed it back, and he said, Grandpa, I was thirsty. <laughs> I like to meet people that are thirsty. Do you know very frequently, I will see people get saved just because it's kind of an option. And do you know why they, they t take it as an option? Well, because there are some other people that say they're saved. They, they say they're saved. And so I might as well do it, maybe get them off my back. So they just take a sip. But I liked it when old Larry Cowan walked in to my office one day, and I've told you about him before, but I'm going to refresh him. He looked both ways like he was watching out for the devil, and he said, Pastor, I'm a wicked man. He knew a little bit about his own need for salvation. And Larry Cowan, the next time I saw him, he lived quite a ways from our church, so he didn't come to our church, but the next time I saw him, he was down on the street corner in front of the mission, pointing a fellow to Christ. He had drank deeply of the water of life. I remember another person, and I think that I've told you about him before, old George, who said, I know that I'm on that old black train to hell. You remember the story and how George accepted the Lord. He, he just wanted a step. But you know, the next time I saw him, he was a deacon in a Baptist church, Bethesda Baptist Church in Aurora, Colorado. And uh, he, had, he had lived a terrible life. I like to see people. I've told you about my Uncle Art, who after he got saved, he had been, he had been so sarcastic about Christians and Christian life. He used to sit and milk the cow, and as he did, he would sing, it's a long, long, he'd sing World War I songs, you know, it's a long, long way to Tipperary. Well, then I came up by the barn, and I listened, and he was singing as he milked the cows, we're marching to Zion. How deeply have we drunk of the water of life ourselves? 
or did you just take a step? Did you just take enough to keep you out of hell and keep you from... Uh, now, now, I realize that the uh, illustration uh, uh, needs, needs to be needs to be, uh, uh, the emphasis needs to be on the fact that a person who gets saved is truly saved. But I just wonder how we create a thirst in a lost world. You know, <clears throat> there are three or four ways. First of all, the heat of the sun ought to create a thirst. And do you know, if you want to just change the word a little, the English word for sun, and put it S-O-N, that's where the light of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ is so evident in the life of those who know him, that people will say, I want that. People will say, I am thirsty for the kind of conviction, the kind of peace that reigns in that person's life. I am thirsty for the lifestyle of that person who is born again. The heat of that light, all of the comforts of that kind of heat could make a person thirsty. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 says, Ye are the salt of the earth. Salt makes people thirsty. I was telling, <laughs> uh, I... I don't know why I told that, except to tell it now, too. I told it to Lila this morning. You know, I can talk about my wife. She's not here. Uh, she's not generally the sweet person that you see. I love her dearly and love her more every day. And I've been praying momentarily about her, but she is terrible. She, uh, my, I was watching her fix my eggs. And she reached over and she got the salt. And she shook it. And the humidity in Illinois has plugged that salt up. And no salt fell on her. She set my eggs and whatever else on the table before, on the snack bar in front of me, the breakfast bar. And so I sat there and I said, honey, would you get the salt? I salted them on the stove. And being the sweet guy that I am, <laughs> I said, that salt shaker is plugged up. And you didn't get any salt on it. So she went and got the salt, and I had breakfast. Come noon, she had goulash. Noodles with hamburger, something like hamburger helper, only it was her own concoction. Very good. And we had, we had our morning argument over the salt on my eggs. Now it's noon. And I had eaten all but about, oh, a half a cup of my goulash. She said to me, well, how'd you like it? I said, well... It could have stood a little salt. It really couldn't. And there was about two tablespoons of salt in the salt shaker. She took the lid off and dumped it. <laughs> Isn't she sweet? <laughs> well, you haven't heard it all, and so I might as well confess the whole works. So then I said one word. You know, you say these words, and it's the inflection that you use. 
I said, honey. And she looked at me with those brown eyes, you know. And I said, we've taught the children not to waste food. Now, if I'm going to eat this, I'm going to have to have water. And so she went over, opened the cupboard under the sink, got the mop bucket out, <laughs> dumped out the brushes and stuff, and shoved it in the sink, started running. I said, now here's another word with the right inflection, sweetheart. I would like to have ice water. So we have an ice maker in that. She pulled that open, pulled this thing out, poured the whole pan of ice in there. Came and set it on the table and sat down and started to eat. <laughs> then I said, darling, <laughs> we have more fun. I pushed away uh, some of the salt and took two more bites and <laughs> threw the rest away, and I wasn't going to drink that mop water. <laughs> then I said this. I said, do you realize that this little fiasco that we've just had cost us somewhere between four and seven cents. And she said it was worth every cent of it. <laughs> Salt makes people thirsty. <coughs> Ye are the salt of the earth. Now, what, what does that mean? That means that you and I have a whole, a whole area in which we are to so walk with the Lord that when we come about, they want our sphere. That your presence is a presence of the Lord. Now, not like the New Age people have it. Please don't get involved with that. But that when you walk in, there is the presence of the Lord because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you've been bought by the Spirit. And the greatest thing you can learn to do is to open and affirm that Jesus is the Christ and your appearance, your life your demeanor, your pleasant spirit, everything ought to speak of him. Now, I like to see people that are that way. And I want God to make me that kind of person. And the fruit of it is most wonderful, as you've experienced. I'm sure that you've experienced the same thing. I sat down in the airport in, in Chicago, and there was a young man sitting there with a baby on his lap. And uh, I said, do you realize that that baby is a heritage of the Lord? And he looked at me. Now, he's probably in his early 20s. He looked at me. He said, I'm also a Baptist. I said, I didn't say I was a Baptist. He went on to tell me that he was from Romania and that he was waiting for his wife. She had just seen some of her Romanian uh, relatives. He was waiting for her to meet him there and they were going to fly back to Romania. Every time we open our mouth, there ought to be that thought that we are the salt of the earth and that we ought to be ready to introduce people to the only water that there is in all the world. There ought to be a readiness on our part to do that. How sad it is when we forget that everything about us ought to point to Christ. All I said of old John the Baptist was a signpost that stood there. And in the first chapter of John in the 29th verse, all I can see is that handout that said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's what I want to be myself. I want to encourage all of us to be that kind. And it may be that there's some changes that have to be made 
in our personal lives so that we become that. You ladies, when you go through the checkout counter, that poor girl that's running that cash register, she can't do anything about the prices. That's right. That operator in some organization, they can't do anything about the rules that run the house. That state employee that sits there and, and determines your cost, they can't do anything about that. By the way, some people say the IRS is cruel and wicked and all this. And uh, I got a bill from the IRS, $105 penalty for uh, late filing. Well, the fellow that files my income tax had a death in his family, so I wrote out a check, $115, because he had made a mistake on it, $115. So I wrote out a check, and I wrote down at the bottom of the paper that I was sending back with him, Dear sir, I have recently discontinued my job. The only thing that I have to live on now is Social Security for the time being. And the man that did my taxes, I wrote on there, had a tragedy in his family, and that's why it was late. Would you please forgive the penalty? About three weeks later, I got a check, $105, from the IRS. They also have a heart. <clears throat> you know, public employees, When you respond and work with them, sometimes you blame them for all the situations. You blame the clerk at the store. Ladies and gentlemen, we ought to walk through a checkout line. Maybe they're the only lost people that you rub shoulders with or the people that you work with. And there ought to be some way in which there can be the evidence of the indwelling Christ in our life. Ye are the salt of the earth. Okay? We need, to te we need to preach on hell. I don't have time to do it this morning, but we need to preach on hell. I think, I think people will thirst after God if they really know about hell. You know, when I got saved, a lot of people say, well, I accepted the Lord as my Savior, and I believe in Lordship salvation. Listen, I believe in lordship salvation too, but I'll tell you, when I got saved, I wasn't so concerned about the lordship of Christ. I was concerned about saving my hide from hell because a good, faithful preacher preached what this book said about the awful destiny of a person who, is, who doesn't go to heaven. And there's only one other place to go. My dear friend, there are, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I'm quoting the Bible. We ought to be the salt of the earth in every way that we can. Now let me, let me go over it again and then we'll close. What about your personal demeanor? Is it one of somber sadness and serious life? Listen, I heard a fellow say this and I've, I really enjoy it. He said, if you take life too seriously, then you don't take God seriously enough. If you take life too seriously, then you don't take God seriously enough. I think a lot of people are so, they, they say, oh, we've, we've had a disaster. A pipe broke. Or uh, we've had a disaster. This has happened. You know, there have been lots of heartaches and burdens in your life. And you know, when, uh, when we were talking about in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What we need to do is learn how many of those trials that we go through just draw us very close to the Lord. They have something to do with the life of sweetness and the savor of salt in the life of the person who is observed by a person who wants to know how they can do it. I told you about Clarice Harris who back in 1944 was teaching a Bible class. And there was a woman that was constantly after her to, to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And uh, so the doorbell rang and Clarice went to the door and she got a telegram and the 
little fella from Western Union said, Mrs. Harris, I'm sorry. And she went in and read it to her Bible class. We regret to inform you that your son, her only son, was killed in action in Italy. Clarice Harris sat down. She had just been teaching this thing. And the, all the class was weeping. She said, all right, folks. Now we've got to get back to our lesson. And the charismatic said, how can you do it? She says, because I've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Christ has been placed in me and I in him and he knows he knows even in trial and then in all those pleasant times all those good things all those trips that you have all those times that the angels are ministering to you in your safety and all of the good things that happen to you why don't you give him the glory ye are the salt of the earth if the salt has lost its favor, wherewith shall it be salted? My dear friends, let's let, I want us to do this, all of us. Look into our own life. Take what the psychologists call an introspective analysis and see where there can be some refinement. Old Gypsy Smith was ugly as a mud fence covered with tadpoles. And he had his arm around me in the King Cole Hotel in Minneapolis and old Václav Wojta, and Václav was from Russia, and he says, I'm thinking that you always preach such simple sermons. He said, why is it people so moved? And old Gypsy Smith, those jowls hanging down there and eyes, he looked at me and he looked at him, and he sang this song. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All his wonderful passions and purity. O oh, thou spirit divine, all my nature refine. Till the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. Shall we pray? Loving Lord, help us to be the salt of the earth that we ought to be. Lord, help us to cause people to desire Thee. Pray, Father that our thirst after thee would be like David's. How that his, how that he panted after thee like a heart after a brook of water. Lord, I pray that you would cause us to do this. And then, Father, if there's some dear person here who has never drunk of the water of life, if there's someone here who has never received you as personal Savior, help them to desire thee while every head's bowed and every eye closed. It's possible that all of you are saved. I hope you are. But if there's someone here that says, Preacher, I have never received Christ as my Savior, I'd like for you to pray for me. Just slip up your hand. Anyone? Anywhere? Slip up that hand and say, I, I'd like for you to pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved. Anyone? Then let me ask you this. Is there someone that says, Preacher, I'd like for you just to remember me in prayer that God would give me the deep, deep desire to allow him to cleanse my life in such a way that I become a greater witness for him that in my presence they will get thirsty after him to want him. Is there someone that say, please pray for me? I mean, someone special. Yes, probably all of us. Yes, yes, many of you. Yes. I want I want to be a, I want to 
I'll take care of those things that need to be corrected in my life that I might serve him. And I want you to pray for me about it. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes. Heavenly Father, more than a dozen people responded, and I respond with them. But Father, I want my life to tell for Thee. I want my life to bring honor to Thee. I pray, Father, that You would make us as a church here at the chapel, make us the salt of the earth. That this would be a light on a hill for those who need to drink and drink deeply of Thy salvation and that fountainhead that is so refreshing. 